Hey there, everybody. My name is Melissa Furness. I'm a professor and an artist. Uh, my work is really about treating painting as a conceptual object that challenges history. Uh, my work explores the idea of a ruin as both a public site and also as express narratives of personal struggle. What I'm doing is working on some pieces in progress that I'd like to sort of take you through my process, show you a little bit about what I do as a painter. Just wanted to give you a little bit of introduction to who I am. And so let's get started. Hey guys, so I'm here in my sort of makeshift studio. Obviously we have to do what we can in regards to studio spaces. I'm working on this really large painting and I wanted to just tell you a little bit about what I'm getting going on. First off, if you're in your home, that proper ventilation is super important. I've got a running fan up above, window open, I've got proper lighting. Um, certainly you need to like wear an apron, have painting rags along with you because I'm an oil painter and even if I have a difficult studio situation, it's important to me to be able to still produce the work that I want to produce. So this piece is in progress. How I develop my work is through an underpainting. So what I do with the underpainting is kind of classical style. I use one color. Sometimes it's a bright color, sometimes it's something a little bit darker. But I develop the entire painting in that one color. I don't put anything else on my palette except for the one color and maybe a little bit of white in case I make a mistake. Uh, develop the whole thing using a lot of washes, um, a lot of uh, terpenoid, which I have here. So I'll kind of get my palette out, open it up here. I've always got it covered. I've always got things that smell in a certain way put away in another cabinet so there's no smell. Um, if I'm not working on it at all, I'll then put it away even like outside uh, in a shed or down in the basement so that there's no uh, problem of anything getting into my environment when I'm just doing my normal living. Uh, so this is my turbinoid. I use a number of brushes at one time. I pretty much always have four or five brushes in one hand and one in the other. Also a rag on hand when I'm painting. So at that first stage I'm using just the turbinoid and the one color. Uh, I develop the entire piece, uh, all the values and a good bit of detail. I would say probably more detail than you might imagine in that first stage. And what I'm working on right now is that second stage. So with the next layer of colors, I work with a limited palette. So I've got the underpainting one color and then as I'm developing it, I am filling out more um, bits of color value range with that color, but it's still not a full palette. So on my palette right now I have about uh, six colors and also some liquid. I don't generally use more colors than that. Sometimes I use less, maybe like four, between four and six. And then I work across the entire piece again. And this time I am developing some value, some additional details, but not completely fully rendered. Uh, Cause that is what I will say for the final layer when I have a full color palette, full detail I'll be working out. But that gives you an idea of where I'm starting with this and then I'm going to go through a little bit more of an up close explanation of what I've got here and what you'll see and then do some sort of stop motion videos so you can see my process as I'm producing the work. So you can see with my brushes as well is that I usually work with a wet brush, dry brush and sometimes kind of like an in-between brush that's sort of semi-wet. I'll develop um, smaller details with a round brush, larger details with a flat. Those are the main two that I usually use, sometimes an angled brush. So when you see me in the video, you'll see me going back and forth between wet and dry, which allows me to blend. So using a, a rag to you know, wipe out colors, to um, start with a fresh color so that I don't have too much muddiness happening with the paint. And then I develop it, basically if the first color, or the first layer is a lot of washes, like I was saying, with the turpenoid. The second layer that I'm developing is going to be more color, but with a lot of liquid, which is going to develop a lot of transparencies and what you would call glazes in terms of technical terms with painting. All right, so let's get going. 
Okay, so this is my painting here. You can see what is still as an underpainting and what I've developed a little bit further. I'm also using gold leaf in this particular work. As I mentioned before, my work deals a little bit, uh, quite a bit with history and manipulating history in a more of a contemporary way. And so you also so see a bit of airbrushing in the background in which I produced early on before I was doing this development with the oil painting because that's an acrylic. So I can take you to show you a little bit. You can see my palette, that's down low there. So that's my limited color palette, along with my brushes. I'll get you a little bit more of a still version of that so you can see what colors I'm working with. So as I do this final layer, you're gonna see a lot more color develop and also even more detail than what you see in this second stage. The second stage I like quite a bit because you're able to develop a good bit more detail and get a, a much better understanding of how the painting is gonna end up uh, looking in the end. It's a quite a bit of fun you know, um, seeing how it's gonna work out. All right, here is a view of my color palette. On the upper right is indigo. Next to it is kind of like an antique yellow and then an Indian yellow, which is super transparent. Um, a sepia brown, a super dark brown. And then, uh, or a burnt sienna. And then um, sort of a maroonish kind of color called Kaput Mortuum, and then a sap green and white, and in the center you have my liquid. So just as an overview of how I, how I utilize the colors is that I really love the sort of deep, rich blue, which is here, along with that sort of really dark brown, which is over there. Um, when I combine those two together, they create a really, really nice, rich black. So I never really buy black out of the tube pretty much ever. I mean, it just creates very dull colors for me and my whole goal is to create vivid, transparent layers. So, you know, with these other colors, it's it suits my classical palette that I'm working with with regards to the subject matter that I'm working with. So that's why we have sort of greens and dark reds, which were part of that palette back in the day. So you'll see me develop what I'm working with and then there's a more of a closer view of my brushes. Like I said, I go back and forth between the dry brush and the wet brush quite often and also using paint rags. I put my finger in the rag and then wipe things away from the canvas at different times and also use the rag to clean the brushes on occasion when I want to get more of a fresh color. seeing some time-lapse elements but I believe it's gonna help you to also have me slow it down a little bit and talk you through a few aspects of what happens while I'm doing thing itself um, in general this is something that I'm gonna be working on right here uh, you see the underpainting area there um, and then I use the liquid in my palette to and also you know dip into the terpenoid in addition to that and basically create a glaze of color, of light color, across over the top of my underpainting to help fill out the form a little bit, define some of the edges, give it a bit of color, you know, and like I said, I go back and forth, wet, I lay down wet, brush across with dry to uh, kind of even it out so that you don't see just a bunch of random brush marks and directions that I don't want it to go in across the piece. Again, define a little bit of value as I'm going as well. Keep dipping into the liquid. Take a look at where the edges of those forms are and start to define that object on top of the others that you see in the painting. So you can see here I've got my handful of paint brushes and then also the colors that I'm just laying in very quickly and then use that dry brush to sort of clear it out, get it to soak into the surface a bit, 
Um, so depending on the effect that I want, I'll let the, uh, the wet paint sit on the surface longer or shorter periods of time. Like this one, I'm just trying to basically get rid of the white that you see that's still there from the underpainting from the original uh, canvas surface that I prepped. And that will allow me to then build up some bits of detail. The form has a little bit of highlight across the top part of it. So I'm gonna try to use this brush to define that upper edge with a bit of highlight separated out from the other objects that are behind it that I've already defined. Listen to the birds chirping outside, woohoo! <clears throat> and then I've got a little bit of detailing on the top of this element here that I'll try to see if I can begin to sort out. Like I said, the underpainting, you know, has a certain amount of detail. A, you know pretty good bit so I can make sure that I've got those forms correct in space so I always make sure that I've got things down correctly in the under painting stage in terms of like perspective and proportion and how things I want how I want the comp composition to be laid out and then with the second stage is when I start to begin to define some details although not absolutely full detail I'll do that on the kind of final layer when I'm filling out full color and full form uh, but here you know you're starting to see defined edges the forms being becoming themselves and starting to get more color and then I used different I used different sizes of brushes depending on what element of detail that I might be adding to something so this has a bit of um, kind of like a decorative top to the object so these are all elements and objects that are coming from historical Dutch still lives that I've kind of stolen or borrowed and then reconfigured and put back together into a different composition that becomes something of what I might call a pile of stuff and really changes your perception of significance or the kind of preciousness of the object. When you see a mass of them together, they lose some of that importance that you might see if they were, that you might notice if they were just individual elements in a specific still life. And I like that way of kind of manipulating history and changing your perception of what these objects are, what they could be. So this piece is actually going to become a bit of a collaboration with a fellow artist who is a sculptor and she does cast iron and also you know different kind of metal elements so in the end this piece as you can see it's kind of got a circular quality to quality to it will end up becoming uh, a stretched trampoline across this cast iron structure that my artist friend is making so you can see here I'm just kind of defining a little bit of detail with my colors, like I mentioned, I like the dark brown and the dark blue to create a nice rich black. You know, in general, you know, the rule is to work with colors that are kind of opposite each other on the color wheel. So if you look at the colors opposite of one another, it's like orange and blue, right? So basically I've got a dark blue or dark orange mixing them together and they neutralize each other. But since I'm using color and not just like a mixed black that I bought, out of the tube, they they keep their vivid richness, and and so that black becomes a lot more deep and a lot more um, velvety, velvety when you see it in real life, which is a quality that I like with my work. So when you have something that is more dull you know, it'll, the object itself will lose its sense of space and depth versus developing it in layers of color, of rich color. So there's a little bit of definition of the top of that form. And then to start to fill out 
some of the other areas. I'm gonna lay in a bit of dark. So what I do is I, I lay in, you know, quite a bit of wet paint, more than you might realize. You know, if you're first starting out, um, students tend to be like a little bit timid or scared of ruining something. But the nice thing about painting is that you can always back, go back and paint back over something again. So I might let it sit like that and even soak into the canvas a little bit because I want it to stay there. Whereas something that I'm just creating a glaze of, then I'll, I'll kind of wipe away much more quickly because I'm just giving it a little bit of color, a little bit of value. So with that one, I'll let it sit for a minute. And so if you're nervous about painting, you might be scared to do something like that, but um, often I'll kind of make a messy painting on top of there, let it sit for a bit, and then I'll come back into it and you'll see what will happen with it. Again, I'm forcing myself to continue with the limited palette, even though I know that in this image that I'm working with, these, these objects do have more colors within them. But this just really helps me um, build up a sense of space and unity amongst all the objects that I'm producing in the work. You can see there's that going. You know, I'll work with a dry brush and some, uh, on occasion it'll get too full of paint and I'll have to pick up a new dry brush, but we'll see how this one goes. So since I do want some of that color to stay down, I don't want to wipe it all away right away, which is why I let it sit there for a while. I'll let it soak into the canvas a bit. And then I'll take my dry brush very delicately and kind of just push it around to get rid of some of the ugly brush strokes that I don't like so much and define a little bit more form and texture in the surface of the piece. So again, you know, at different points I'll be like touching um, the canvas very lightly with the dry brush or more heavily with the dry brush depending on the effect that I'm going for. Um, that one might be getting a little bit too full of paint so I'm kind of switch to one that's a little bit drier. And I do have loads of brushes. I don't just work with the same old five brushes. I have a whole stack of them over there on the side so that I can keep continuing to create a variety of marks. You know, variety is super important um, to create some unique effects with your paint. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with how that looks. Now I'm gonna uh, dip into the turpenoid, wipe off my little brush here and go back to the white and define a little bit more of the highlights on this other edge. So the white, as we know, is fairly opaque. So I tend to build up my work, you know, in transparent colors. I use the white for, you know, defining edges that are kind of smaller details. I don't put too, too much of it unless it's a super highlighted area like this one is here. I usually save most of those smaller details for the final layer. Um, it also depends on what my deadlines are. You know, sometimes I'll be like really scrounged for time with an exhibition or something I have to get done and I'll kind of force myself to work a little bit more quickly. I'll consciously like time myself and say, okay, uh, um, I can have, you know, whatever 30 minutes on developing one each one of these forms across the work and then I know that it's going to get a certain amount of completeness that I need in time for, for me to be able to show it. Um, it's not ex always the funnest way to work. I mean, I really appreciate being able to, uh, you know, have a little bit more of a leisurely pace to it like I'm doing now, but there's times where you just simply have to get a bunch of work done and you want it to have the quality and the standards that are important to you. And so in general, that's the way that I do it. So you can see there that's starting to get a little bit more form. The time lapse helps in terms of like speeding things up. It's not like terribly exciting for me to blabber on and on, but this is gonna give you 
some added instruction to help you understand what's going on in the time lapse as I'm developing it. So I'll do just a little bit more on this sort of lid here and then I'll go back to working a little bit more quickly in the time lapse and then you can see how the piece continues to develop. So they're just defining the edges here a bit more because I want to make sure that you can, you know, sort of see spatially what's happening with each one of these objects that I'm painting. Um, so I'll figure out this edge over here. And you can see, I guess, um, other things that I do is that, you know, some artists use those kind of like painting sticks or something like that, which is, is cool, but I, you know, I'm never good enough at like trying to get that whole thing set up. So here we have my finger, my pinky finger with a little bit of a, a nail on it. <laughs> so I'll use that to balance my hand when I'm doing something more detailed. So the funny thing is that if you look closely, I mean, if I look closely, um, yeah, I'll see like little like art divots in my painting that I'll have to then go back later and kind of flat, you know, fix up, which is sort of funny, but you know, you know, it's my little fingernail trying to balance and trying to be um, still with my hand and steady with my painting method. What else? I guess you, if you want to do something that's a little more detailed work, you, you can't drink too much coffee because that will make you shake, but haha. -ha. Um, so you can see how I'm getting a little bit more of an edge there as well. You know, and that's you know a good um, a good enough amount of detail for me at this point until I get into the final layer of the painting. everyone for joining me for today's painting session. I um, hope you enjoy the work and hopefully I'll see you back for another demo sometime soon. Thanks!